Good morning on this crisp day. Good morning. Good morning. Call your attention to our announcements. <clears throat> First, in the frequently asked questions, insert just uh, in the Family Life Center parking lot, uh, if you'll leave room for those that are handicapped and uh, older. Uh, if you can park in another parking lot, if you're good and able like many of us are, that would be good. Uh, and <clears throat> there will be child care available at that time if it's needed, if you'll let us know so we can have, be sure to have enough help. Now for our other announcements. Uh, Wednesday night dinner reservations need to be made by Monday. Uh, the community and luncheon will be at Faith this week. Uh, need to make your reservations here and we'll let them know. Again, Monday is good to get those done. Food truck ministry, we've been announcing that several weeks and it needs to move forward with more volunteers. A number have stepped forward, but uh, a lot more could be used. I encourage you to do that. <clears throat> the UMCOR, uh, if you want to give aid to the people of Ukraine, 100% of what you give will be passed through the UMCOR fund. Vacation Bible School registration is uh, opening up. That's June 20th through 23rd. It's not that far away. And then the uh, Save the Date, the fifth quarter tailgate event. Uh, read that. That's May 4th, and uh, more will be coming on that. That's the uh, uh, one other thing. The attendance pads are on the center aisle, on the pews, if you would take and sign in and pass them down. With that, let's lay our announcements aside and let's prepare to worship. with you and also with you oh lord our god we thank you this is the day that you have made we'll rejoice and be glad in it you sustained us through the darkness and you've blessed us with life today when life seems to assail us may we be secure in the faith that you have given us we know we don't deserve anything but judgment but jesus you have ransomed us and we thank you for that now may our worship and praise please you. Amen. Our opening hymn is number 400, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. You'll stand in this scene.
we sing of God's glory. Now the important question that the Apostles' Creed is an answer to, among others, is Christians, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Almighty God, how grateful we are for your love and for your care and for your saving grace. And how grateful we are to be here, Lord, to worship you. Now, as we continue to worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings, Lord, we pray that you bless these gifts as we give in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. time we'll invite the children to the altar for children's time at the altar before you're seated please greet one another welcome each other to church this morning please
Love you too. Good job, guys. It's good to see y'all. Here you go. All right. It's good to see everybody good. Everybody looks so good today. That's wonderful. All right. Hey, listen, guys. You know, this is a very special time in the life of the church. And we're getting ready for a big holiday. What's the next holiday? Anybody know what the next holiday is that's coming up? Big holiday? Where you might hunt eggs and you might... Easter! That's right, Easter. As we're getting ready to celebrate Easter, in a few weeks, we're going to celebrate Easter. And we're going to celebrate. It's going to be wonderful. But this time in the church, it's called Lent. Can you say that? Lent? Lent. L-E-N-T. Lent. And it's the time, it's a funny time, because on the one hand, it's kind of sad. And we do things like, we, we put wood on the cross. You see how we put wood on the cross up there? And wood on the cross back there? And, 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 and we, we use purple. And, so, and it's kind of, some of those songs are a little bit sad. Because we think about Jesus, and how Jesus went to the cross. Yeah, how Jesus died and stuff. But on the other hand, it's happy too. Because it tells us how much Jesus loves us. And I got you some. I got some, I got woke up this morning feeling so happy this morning. So I brought yeah, go ahead. Tell. So I brought something that makes me happy. These are bubbles. They make me happy. The bubbles make you happy. I want to I want to give everybody some bubbles to make us happy because even though it's a sad time in some ways, it's a good time because it tells us how much Jesus loves us. So those are for after church, okay? <laughs> after church okay yes you're welcome okay all right let's let's pray lord thank you for loving us so much lord and help us to remember how much you love us and may that thought make us very happy to know that you'll never forget us and that you'll always love us thank you lord in jesus name amen amen and let us sing again jesus keep me near the cross 301 would you stand with me and would you sing with me this beautiful hymn of faith
May be seated. As we move into our time of prayer, we'll begin with a musical interlude, and then I will lead us forward. May we bow in prayer. Lord God, your word has told us of wars and rumors of war. The Ukrainian people understand this quite well as war rages in their land. It's evil inflicted on them. God, deliver them, we pray. May peace come now for them, for Russia, for this world. Lord, we pray that this may happen. Lord Jesus, you left heaven for earth, for every one of us. We were dead in our trespasses and sin. When we think about it, it does not make sense that you would even notice us as weak and sinful as we are. There's not even one thought, let alone action, that you don't know. We want to say that we're like Job, and are unjustly afflicted. But in truth, we're more like David in his sin with Bathsheba. Lord, that we're guilty, every one of us. Yet you paid our debt. By the price of your life, to liberate us from our sins. We want to think that we're just fine. We may grumble and complain about others, then, God of grace, your word convicts us of our problems. We realize that it's not others that need to change, but it's us. So may each of us hear what we should hear. May we realize that without you, Jesus, we are justly condemned. But by your grace, we are forgiven. Then may we allow you, Holy Spirit, to change our hearts and our very being. God, we know that you know each of us completely. So search each of us and reveal our anxious and evil thoughts. Then lead us in your way to obedience. Please don't crush us with too much. Rather, just one thing at a time. Then spare us your judgment in Jesus, who is our only Savior. Jesus, you lift us up when we stumble, and you set us on your right path. That's love. May we let it flow to the lost of this world. You know each and every one of us in this world completely, let alone right here. It's wrong to not help the lost we know. May we listen to the still small voice within us and may we follow it in leading into action that all may know you. Now, we pause and we return to you the prayer that you gave us that we call the Lord's Prayer as we say together, Our Father, who art in heaven, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Our scripture lesson this morning is one of the parables of Jesus. It's kind of a scary parable to read, to be honest with you. But let's, uh, let's read it together. If you'll turn your Bibles to Luke, the 13th chapter, and then over to the 6th verse. Hear God's word. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, see here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? And he replied, sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig around it and pour manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. This is the word of God for the people of God. Our thanks be to God. Well, first of all, let's start by saying this, that farming and gardening is hard. It's hard. It's really, really hard for me. I'll admit that. I'm not good at it. Uh, I love the story, by the way, and you've probably heard this story, forgive me for telling you, about the older man who farmed with his son. And his son did some bad things. His son got arrested and was sent to prison. And, and the old man, he, he was getting on in years, and he really couldn't manage the farm by himself. So he wrote to his son in prison, and he said, son, I can't believe you did what you did. And now you're in jail. And here it is. It's time to plow the field. And I'm too old to do it by myself. How in the world are we going to get this done? How, well, how are we going to do What are we going to do next year? And the son wrote his father back and said, dad, whatever you do, don't plow that field. He says, that's where I hid the loot from the robbery. All the money and the jewels and the guns are all buried in that field. Leave it alone. When I come home, when I get out, I'll dig it up and we'll have more than enough money to live comfortably the rest of our life. Well, the next day, the father got up and he heard a commotion. He looked in the field and there was the police and the GBI and the FBI and all of his neighbors out digging in that field frantically looking for something. And they dug and they dug and they dug all day and they didn't find the money, they didn't find the guns, they didn't find the, the jewels, they just threw up their hands and they went home. The old man wrote his son and told them what happened. And the son said, yeah, I knew that would happen if I wrote that letter. Now the field's all plowed. Now we can just plant. You're good to go. <laughs> Silly story. But, you know, it's hard to do. It's hard to do. A farmer told his son what had happened. In our story today, there are three characters. And what I want to do with the time we have, I want us to look at each of those characters, and then I want us to share six lessons very quickly that I think we can learn from this little story. The first one is this. The upset owner. That's the first character. He's the picture of divine disappointment, the owner. A man planted a fig tree in the garden, and he came again and again to look, but there was no fruit on it. And he was very disappointed. When you plant a tree or you plant some crops and you get no fruit, you're disappointed, aren't you? You know, when Hannah preached uh, last time, she told us how she didn't have a green thumb either. And she told us how Nina uh, gave us all succulents. So last year, Nina was here for Christmas, succulent plants. And we took them home. And Hannah said she was sad to say that her succulent plants died. Even though Nina had told us all, you really can't kill these things. They're so hardy. They don't need anything, really. They'll, they'll live. You don't, don't worry about it. And Hannah said that she killed hers, you know. And she was so sad about that. What she didn't tell you graciously is that I killed mine before Hannah killed hers, you know, <laughs> that, that, that mine died. But the other part of the story she didn't tell you is that Nina had sympathy for Hannah, but she had nothing but condensation for me. I mean, she gave me all kinds of grief about killing those plants. But there's another part of this story. About the same time, Nina and I also planted fig trees in our backyard. And Nina, you know, is a master gardener, and, 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 and Nina, Nina cultivated the ground, and, and she did everything right, and she, she took care of that fig tree uh, very well. I just dug a hole and stuck it in the yard, you know, in the backyard and covered it up and forgot, forgot about it. But guess what? Nina never got a fig off that fig tree. And my fig tree's growing and just fill figs every year, more figs than I know what to, to, to do. I shouldn't be smiling while I'm telling this story, but... <laughs> But I, but I, but I, but I, but I, I, I am. But what do you plan? You, you expect something, don't you? 
The owner, no doubt, is God, of course. And God, no doubt, is the owner of our lives. And God created us for a specific pur purpose. And he's, he's disappointed every time we're not serving that purpose. Our purpose is to worship God. Our purpose is to love God and to love one another and to produce fruit for his kingdom. If God created us like a, like a machine or, or a computer, we surely would, would follow his command without any options. We do what we're supposed to do. We produce all the fruit we were created to produce. But that's not the way it works. And that wouldn't be love. If the only reason we obey God, worship God, love one another is because we're programmed to do that and we can do nothing else, it, it cannot be love. So God decided to create us with free will. This gave us the right and the capacity to decide whether or not we're going to obey God or whether we're going to disobey God. And if we obey God, then we will give joy to the heart of God. But when we disobey God, it grieves God. We have the ability to produce fruit. And when we produce fruit, it brings joy to God's heart. And we fail to do that. It disappoints God. And we know we cannot be perfect. And we know that we cannot perfectly produce fruit or perfectly obey God's law. Well, what's the purpose of the law? The law helps us to be conscious of our sin. Romans 20 says, therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sin. But the second person in the story is the tree. The unproductive tree. Finally, he said to the gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single thing. Cut it down. It's taking up space we can use for something else. See, the sad and scary part of that story is that, that we're the tree. We're the unproductive tree. We have not done what God desired us to do. Again, what were we created to do? The judgment has already been pronounced. We haven't done it. Cut it down. We've sinned. The wages of sin is death. We're undone. We're convicted sinners. But there's good news. And that comes in the third character. And the story. See, the grace of God suddenly enters the story. God's mercy comes in human form through the only begotten Son of God, Christ Jesus. Thank God for the third character in the story, the gardener, the picture of grace. As the gardener answers, no, it's not producing fruit, but give it another chance. Leave it alone another year. Let me give it, let me give it some, some special attention. Let me, let me give it some, some, some fertilizer, some, some, some kindness and some, some food and, and let's see what happens. The gardener, of course, is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the answer to our impending judgment. Suddenly, the director of the play, the writer of history, enters into his own saga as one of us. And, and Jesus is clear. Jesus doesn't do away with the law. Judgment is still coming. It's still coming. He doesn't do away with it. But rather he fulfills the law by becoming the sacrifice for all humanity and bringing us mercy and, and grace. And we rejoice. The law of justice demands that we be cut down. The law of justice demands that we be judged. The law of justice demands that we're guilty. Because none of us are perfect. We're all sinners, every single one of us. But God's mercy says, give it another chance. And here comes Jesus, bravely and willingly facing suffering and death so that he can give us new life and new strength, new hope and a new identity. Because of Jesus, something, something happens to us. From being losers, we become victorious. From being convicted, we become justified. From being condemned, we become saved. From being weak, we become strong. From being rejected, we become accepted. From being unproductive, we become useful. So, so, so that, that's the story. Now let me share with you six quick lessons, okay? The first one is this. Leaves apparently aren't enough. We've got to produce fruits. 
We've been planted to multiply, to produce fruits. What do we mean by that? What do I mean by that? Have you ever planted, you know, I know you have, tomatoes, and, and, and every once in a while, you'll plant, and, and I don't know why, you know, I'm not a gardener, but every once in a while, you'll plant a tomato plant, and it will grow, oh my, it grows so beautifully, and it grows so tall, and so full, and the leaves are so lush, and so, so green, but there's no tomato on it. <laughs> you don't get any tomatoes, or very few tomatoes. It looks great, but there's no fruit. Sometimes we're like that. As men and women of faith, sometimes it's churches. Oh, we look great. But is there fruit? I mean, we get all cleaned up and we put on our clothes and we say the right words and we go to the right places and we do all the right. But is there fruit? We build a, a beautiful cathedral and, and we put stained glass windows in it and, and we dress it all up. But is there, is there fruit? We need to produce fruit. What do we mean by fruit? Changes in our own lives. Fruit of the Spirit. Kindness, gentleness, self-control, love. Fruit. As in feeding the hungry and caring for the least among us. Fruit. As in making new disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. This is our mission. To produce fruit. You know, there's a question that preachers get asked a lot. And we ought to ask all the churches this question. The question is, is this. If something happened to your church, if it, just, if it just, just, just went away somehow, besides the members of the church who go there, who would miss it? Would anybody miss it? In other words, are, are, are your church producing enough fruit that the, that the community would, would notice, that the town would notice, that the, that, the, that the county would notice, the state would notice, the world would notice? Are we producing enough fruit? Who would notice if your church suddenly disappeared? Here's another lesson. Listen to it. If you're trying to produce an apple when in fact you are a fig tree, then you'll always be disappointed. Who are we? Who are we? What is the, what is the fruit that we're supposed to be producing? One church I served did not have any youth or children attending it. And they worked at that and they fretted about that and they spent all kinds of resources on, on that. But we did discover that we had an awesome group of senior adults. So one day we decided, well, let's work to our strength. And, and, and so, so soon we, we, we had, a, had, a, had a church filled with senior adults. And guess what? They started bringing grandchildren. And they started bringing their children. And soon we had all ages coming. Don't try to be something you're not. God created you uniquely you. God has, has planned before you were born good works for, for you to do. And you are the best one. You are the most qualified one to do those works. You are the only one who can be you and do the things that God places before you. When God puts something on your heart, pay attention. Do it. If you are a fig tree, God created you to naturally produce figs. Produce figs. If you're an apple tree, produce apples. If you're a nut tree, that's not a bad example there. Huh? More importantly, we're the church of Jesus Christ. We're not a social club. We're not a charity. We're not a social justice organization. Although all of those things, all of those things are very important. But most important of all, we're the church of Jesus Christ. Who's mission is to go out and make disciples of Christ for the transformation of the world. The third lesson I would give you is that, that the trees were, were planted on the same soil. Others were bearing fruit and some were not. We can't use our environment as an excuse for not becoming productive. Friends, I know you're as tired as I am of excuses. Of excuses for everything and from everyone. You know, a politician's may be the worst, but we're all guilty. God has given us everything we need to bear fruit. 
It's always interesting to me as a preacher to hear folks explain why they can't do this or can't do that or can't do this or can't come, come, come to that. I think you'll find the time and the will and the way to do what you truly want to do. I've seen it over and over again. You'll find the time and the will and the way to do what you truly want to do. Does your calendar and your expenses reflect what you claim to be the priorities in your life? If not, then either begin to change the way you spend your time and your money or be honest and admit to yourself what your true priorities are. Lesson four, if you're not producing fruit, then we're only consuming. You know, some folks are dreamers, some folks are planners, some folks are doers, and all are needed as part of God's plan. But some folks just want to sit back and criticize and be obstacles. Don't ever be one of those people. Several years ago, a pastor friend of mine had to make a hard decision in the life of his church. And, and it was a hard decision and not everybody uh, agreed with it. it. It caused a lot of dissension in the church and it was about to tear the church apart. And, and a bishop who I greatly respect came to them and, and, and preached at the church during that time. And I'll never forget what the preacher told them. The preacher said this to them. He said, you know, you have every right to agree or disagree with what the preacher is doing. And you have every right to work to change the direction that he was leaning, of course. And of course, you've got every right to, to leave if you want to. But what you don't have a right to do as a follower of Jesus Christ, what you don't have a right to do as a Christian, as a member of that church, is to be a stumbling block to the advancement of the kingdom of God, to speak hate and false information in that congregation. Are you producing? Or are you merely consuming resources, time, energy? Fifth lesson is this. The dirt and the dung thrown on the tree. You can read that as the bad treatment you get from others. The injustice, the problems, the shakings of all kinds of bad situations that come. They can serve as, as cultivation. They can serve as, as fertilizer in our life and make us fruitful if we let them. See, when we try to, to help a, a tree produce fruit, we, we often do things that, I don't know, if I was a tree, I would think would be rather unpleasant. We spread manure around. We, we, we prune the tree. We, we cultivate the, the soil. In our lives, things happen. We feel like at times when we're, 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 being, we're being pruned, when things are taken away from us that we love, we get our ground tilled up. We become un uncomfortable. Things that we're comfortable with are, are turned upside down. Sometimes it feels like, like manure is being spread all around. And we can complain about those things and we can get bitter about those things. Or we can use the experiences to help us grow and produce fruit. And to love others. And finally, lesson six, the most important lesson. There is a judgment coming. Again, the Christ figure did not say there's never going to be a judgment. What did he say? Give it one more year. And then cut it down if it's still not producing. But when the law says you have to die because of your sin, love says you'll live because of grace. So I tell you today, give thanks to God. Give thanks today. Give thanks to God that he doesn't ever give up on us. Give thanks to God for Jesus who intervenes on our behalf. Give thanks to God for our salvation. That it's not based on our merit, on our goodness. For we have all fallen short. Give thanks to God that he came and died for our sin for forgiveness, for our salvation. Give thanks to God for when we fail and fall and don't produce, Christ will forgive us. And I give thanks to God for the amazing grace of God. Can we think about that? About that amazing grace of God? If you're turning your hymnals today to page 378, and let's sing about that. The altar's open. If they want to come and, and spend some time in, in prayer, or if you made a decision you'd like to share, I invite you to come forward. Whoever will, let them do so. Let's stand as we sing. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound.
Christ and may the grace of God and may the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you and abide with you this day and forevermore. Go forth from this place and be who and what God created you to be. And by the grace and strength and power of Christ, may you bear much fruit and be blessed by God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen.